Okay, looks like we're good to go here. All right, I am going, nope, that's not what I need. I'm gonna start There we are. Okay guys, how's everybody doing? I hope good. I'm going to start today with um, Picasso's Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. Um, this was painted in 1907 by Pablo Picasso, maybe one of the most recognized artists of our time. Um, and this is something he painted a little bit later on in life. Um, you know, in class, I would ask you guys what you see. This is weird because I'm going to have to tell you, I guess, what you see. Um, formal qualities, it is angular and sharp. Um, the colors contrast between the background, which is cool, and the warm tones in the bodies. Um, it's peculiar. This is the first time we're seeing a nude um, being painted in such an aggressive way, although I think Manet's Olympia opens up to this t style of, of painting where the females here are looking directly at us. Um, they don't look coy. They don't look soft and demure. They are hardened. Um, they're maybe even aggressive. And the way that they're standing, you know, invites us to look at their angular bodies. Um, they even the fabric in the background is angular and hard um, the painting itself has very little um, depth the foreground middle ground and background all seem to be as one um, some of you guys might notice I know when I talked about it with some of you you notice immediately the masks on these faces here um, Picasso is very much um, influenced by African masks um, and culture he saw going on during um, you know the types of colonialism that was that were going on um, at the turn of the century and he um, was influenced by this you know was excited by this idea of this exotic um, types of art like the mask that we learned about in African art we have a nod to a still life down here uh, it's very flattened with the grapes and the fruit down here on the table, if you want to call it that. Um, the bodies are composite views, like we kind of talked about again in African art where, for example, this figure here is facing away from us, but the face is looking at us. Um, we can see in other bodies where, um, you know, the shape of the body or um, the hips are pointing one way and the shapes of the bodies are pointing another. Um, it sort of doesn't make sense. And let's take a look at some uh, context. When Picasso was young, even younger than this, um, I'm talking 15, 16, before the time he was 20, this is how he was painting. He was regarded as a um, savant. I mean, he was a genius. He already knew how to paint like this um, by the time he was 20 years old, which is pretty daunting, I'm sure, for you high schoolers out there. Um, he was a genius, and he painted full time. And and so, I don't know, I feel like if you paint like this, where you've reached this level of technique, where you've of mastery, where else is there to go? Um, you could spend the rest of your life painting like this and exploring different themes, or you could do as Picasso did and sort of lean in to what was going on at the time. Um, so another example here, a 15 year old self portrait, a 25 year old self portrait and an 89 year old self portrait. These are all that he painted at those ages. So you can see it's not that his art was deteriorating. This is important because you can see that he was choosing to paint like this. Um, so sometimes I hear students say things like, oh, my five-year-old brother could paint like that. But in realistic, um, you know, in real life, he was choosing certain ways to paint in order to deconstruct painting itself. So the concept behind the style of painting was much more advanced than we at first give it credit to. Um, so 
for this painting, he went and saw, while he was in Paris, this painting up here to the top right, which is not his. If you're my student, you should know this is Cezanne's painting. And he was inspired by the way Cezanne would paint multiple views of one landscape within the same painting and deconstruct the landscape into um, blocks and cubes and um, different pieces and parts of the landscape. Um, so this is just a character of Picasso I found. I thought was cute. Um, so he's really inspired by that. Remember we talked about Cezanne being the father of Cubism. So Picasso comes back to his studio and creates this. And this isn't the first time. This is in a real brothel. I mean, he went to a real brothel to paint this. Um, there was a real, there were women and men in the brothel that he was originally painting. Um, but then he deconstructs the forms and the figures and the values, uh, simplifies it, and creates this. Um, it's really large. It's a really large painting, um, life size, in fact, um, as far as the figures are concerned. And then he unveils it to his best friend, um, Brock, who's, who we're going to look at. And when he unveils it, most people are sort of confused. And some people are very dismissive and... Um, you know, just like anything brand new, most of the time we don't like it. And there's a few like, mm, this is maybe a little interesting. So oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, that was the original take on this. Uh, some of you know, if you've seen more um, Picasso paintings, he goes on to really embrace the style. He calls it cubism. And um, we know later on he continues to paint the style and develop it and work with it until his death. But really the important thing to know here is, you know, he's deconstructing a painting. Um, the concept behind this painting is not to paint women as though Titian did, where the light is softly illuminating the skin and everything looks touchable and realistic. This is sort of old, it's going out of style to paint what you see, to just record what you're looking at. Artists now, like Picasso, are trying to find ways to reinvent painting so that um, it's different and unique and it, it shows their um, perception of what's going on. And so his perception of these women at the brothel, to me, are that they're very hardened and rough around the edges, um, literally and figuratively, that they are, um, you know, tough exteriors. And I think maybe you have to be to do this type of profession. I don't know. Um, but they're not somebody's wife or, you know, um, somebody's lover here. These are, you know, women of the night. So that's important because I think the way he paints them helps us to understand the way he feels about these women. So, uh, Picasso, one of my favorite quotes that he talks about is um, that every child is an artist and when they grow up, not word for word, they can't, it, every child is an artist, the problem is trying to remain one when you grow up. And I think Picasso thought about why children draw the way that they do and why and he tried to sort of relate that back to his work so something else to just keep note of okay moving on now his best friend here um was also a cubist artist in fact they partnered up brock and uh picasso were partners in cubism and worked at the same time so um this is the portuguese by brock and this is embodies cubism. So um, cubist artists try to show their total visual understanding of the subject on a flat campus. What does that mean? Well, I wish I could ask you what you think you see, but I can't. So I'll again, I'll tell you. Um, Brock was sitting in a um, jazz, um, a little jazz bar and watching the performer being illuminated um, by a single light and he 
thought about ways he can paint the different perspectives of that jazz artist and the instruments in different directions so that we can understand the, the form entirely. It's really confusing, right? Um, for example, so here you can see a clearer image. You can see the brush strokes, you can see the segmented um, colors and shapes, very sort of geometric. Um, a little bit of background knowledge about Brock, he, he originally painted posters. Um, and so, and you know, um, ads and things like that. So that's why you oftentimes will see numbers and letters because he was very used to, and he already had the skill set to stencil these types of letters onto um, canvas. So this one here has that same look where the letters and the numbers are in there. Um, but some of you can take apart a little bit. If you can look at it, you know, um, for an extended period of time here for just a minute, I guess, um, you can see the light and the, the light um, that it's casting. You can see the instruments here. Um, maybe you can make out a face or maybe some arms or legs. I'm going to let that be up to your visual interpretation. Um, it's important to note that the cubists believed in using monochromatic or very neutral tones. Monochromatic is one color um, from dark to light, like brown here, so that it didn't take away from the form. So that instead of focusing on color, you're really just looking at the form and the shapes. So, um, oh, here I am um, at the um, Met in New York at um, standing in front of a cubist piece by Brock, very similar, so you can see the size orientation, you know, about the same size. Um, here's a great, I think maybe it helpful understanding of what cubism is. Um, I want to, except for a cup is not a very complex subject matter, but I want to paint, paint a Starbucks coffee cup. And maybe I want to talk about uh, commute, um, consumerism. This is hard. It's my first video. Be nice. Um, in it too, because maybe that's what I think of when I think of Starbucks. Okay? So I want to render this cup. I want to render the front, the sides, the back. I want to render the insides of it, the bottom, and how I feel about the cup and what it might represent all together on one canvas. How can I do that? Well, a uh, cubist artist would say, I'm going to have to break the cup up. I'm going to have to tear it up into pieces and then put it back together on the same canvas in a monochromatic painting. So this is just a photograph, but here on the left is an example of a coffee cup, cubist piece. Um, and maybe include, you know, angles of the cup in how I all the different angles and shapes within the same composition. Um, let me see if there's anything else I need to include here. I don't think so. Uh, I think I've covered most of it. I sure hope I'm not forgetting anything. Um, all right, we'll go on to Self-Portrait as a Soldier um, by Kirchner. Um, this is German Expressionism. Um, Kirshner has a really interesting story about this painting. Again, in class, I would ask you guys what you see and what you think you see and what it might represent. So I want you to think about that right away. Um, a little context and, okay. In 1905, together with other young artists, he founded the German expressionist group Die Brücke, which means the bridge. Um, this will hopefully sound very familiar, but he, it was a call to arms. We call all young people together, and as young people who carry the future in us, we want to wrest freedom for our actions and for our lives from the older, comfortably established forces. So, um, he was, the whole idea of Die Brücke's manifesto was to paint um, a rebellion against the very rich, older, high class. Um, 
you see this in 250 and I think you see this in contemporary society. What's the term okay boomer all about? It's about young people getting fed up with a certain type of older generation that might be stuck in their ways or might, you know, um, be treating other people a certain way. So I think this hopefully, you know, you can relate maybe. This guy um, is a painter, like I said, he has lots of other paintings. You can Google it, his other paintings. I should include them on the slide next time. But this one is the one we're talking about, so I don't want to confuse anybody. He, the war is coming, um, World War I, and, you know, um, Hitler's coming to enlist the army. He doesn't want to go to war. He's a soft, gentle, painterly soul. Um, so he immediately enlists as a driver because he doesn't want to um, be on the battlefields. So he's a driver in the army for a while. He gets um, kicked out, for lack of a better word. I know there's a better word there. I forget what it is. He gets kicked out of the army um, because he has bad lungs and declining mental health and bad hearing. So um, when he comes back, he paints this. Um, and let's look at this for a second here. What do we notice? We notice he doesn't have a hand and the arm is kind of green. Well, um, he's talking to not, not only about injuries from the war. No, he didn't actually lose his hand, but he felt like he was right-handed, that he had lost his ability to be an artist. He lost part of that. So the hand that he uses to make art is gone and it has a bit of gangrene um, which is a military disease where due to the mud and the cold, your, your skin literally starts to rot. Um, so he talks a little bit about that in the piece. He puts himself, even though he's in his studio painting, that's the setting, in a military outfit to show us um, that he's a soldier and the effects of being a soldier. Um, in the background, you see a nude form. He's in his studio um, painting a nude. That's what a lot of artists did. And yet he is not facing the model. He, his eyes are expressionless. In fact, they're completely blued out. So he looks almost like a zombie. Um, on his back left, we see a little bit of depth because this uh, painting here is on an angle. That's the painting he's working on. Um, you know, it shows that he's a painter but he's also, um, you know, he's an artist, but he's also feeling the effects of being a soldier. He's very angular. He looks thin and hollow, weathered, sickly almost. Um, and I think that's important to note. And that's how his, his mental health, how he felt mentally. So the rest of the story goes, um, he is depressed. He's distraught due to the war. He feels like he doesn't have a place, like he can't paint like he used to. Uh, it doesn't help that Hitler comes and takes his work along with all of the other paintings that were rebellion against um, the older generation, the Die Brücke movement, uh, and puts it in a museum for um, making fun of him. Um, just saying, this is a how this is very cruel, but a museum full of really dumb, stupid paintings, and making fun of all of the paintings that were in there. That, of course, does a number on Kirshner. Um, that's that's not nice, and it's awful. And Kirshner views himself as a as a painter, and that, you know, spins him into a deeper, um, even deeper depression. He turns to opioids, and he's an alcoholic, and the story is that um, he hears bombs out his window of his studio, and he hears the bombings, and he hears them coming closer, and he decides to end it. So that's the sad ending of his life. Sad painting. Um, not necessarily a great technical painting, but lots of interesting backstory um, and context to it so oops next 
Oh, also, I forgot. I'm glad I had this on. Very influenced by primitive art, um, like you see here. And you can see the brush strokes and the primitive forms here. Next, I'll talk about Kathy Kolowitz's uh, memorial sheet of Carl Liebknecht. Um, or Lieb Liebknecht? I'm sorry. You know I'm not good at these pronunciations. I'm going to get better. Um, but you can see how it's spelled there, which is good. So I love Kathy Kolowitz's stuff. Um, it's emotional. It tears at your heartstrings, and it shows the effects of war um, and poverty and um, especially on women and children. And in this case, she had already gained some fame. These are prints, white and black woodcut prints. Um, people already knew what she was doing. She was creating, um, let's see if I have it in here, other prints like this, um, a, a mother and father just finding out, you know, that her, their son had died in war. Um, prisoners of war. This reminds you, hopefully, of another artist and his print about war. Goya. Goya. Um, and she's gained a name for herself. And then this happens. So um, the socialists, and I'll read it out loud for you. The socialists, and just in case you're listening and not looking, the socialists and communists both wanted to eliminate capitalism and establish uh, communal control over the means of production. But while the socialists believed the best way to achieve that goal was to work step by step from within the capitalist structure, the communists called for an immediate total social revolution that would put governmental power in the hands of the workers. So a bit more aggressive approach, right? In the spirit, the KPD staged an uprising in Berlin in January 1919. So the KPD is the communists. Military units called in by the SPD, which is the socialists, surprised the uprising and captured two of their leaders. Um, oh, I lied. This is not the socialists, but the, the original, the communists. Um, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Lu um, Luxemburg. They were both murdered while in custody, and their death struck a chord across the left-wing landscape and were widely celebrated as martyrs for the communist cause. So, just to be clear, the SPD is not the socialist. That was the uh, original regime, the capitalist regime. So both when this happened, the socialists and the communists, even though the socialists didn't necessarily agree with how they did it, they were they still felt, um, you know, they, they felt sad about what had happened. Um, Kovitz was not a communist and even acknowledged that the SPD um, would have had been had better leaders, but she heard him speak and admired his charisma. So when the family asked her to create the work to memor memorialize him, she agreed. So um, this is the piece she created. And I want to talk about the form. We've got sort of a lamentation here, a white block leading our eyes with these horizontal lines all the way to the face of our martyr here. Um, We've got um, vertical lines leading up um, to the middle ground here, the middle space. Um, and it is mostly dark, with the exception of the detail of one man's face leaning down with his carefully carved hand, mourning Carl. And in the top register here, you can see all of the faces of the mourners, most of them looking down, out in sadness, crying, and then we've got one, have you, did you see it yet? Right here looking directly at us. These are all mostly men, with the exception of this woman and her child, because we know this is what um, Kathy Kolvitz was um, famous for, was doing women and children, because they really showed the emotional impact um, of what was going on in society very high contrast because you don't have any real middle tones. You've got black and white and that high contrast really hits you. It is anytime you work with just high contrast, the emotion and the shock factor and the um, composition is going to really be striking. And so when you work with just with prints, you have to pay attention to line 
and she does a really nice job here of using lines that juxtapose against one another to create um, feelings and emotions on people's faces um, and lead our eye around the print. Hmm, what does this look like? Have we seen any other paintings where we have mourners mourning over a martyr or a person who has died for the cause? Sure we have. Let's take a look. Let's see if I'm thinking what you're thinking. Do you remember this painting from the Scrivini Chapel, the Lamentation? Very similar. We've got our martyr here being surrounded by mourners and the top register even of smaller faces, the middle register, um, and leading lines leading us to our martyr here, which has sort of a halo and, whoa, look at that, sort of a halo here too. Similar. All right. Um, Stepanova's results of the first five-year plan, another comment about what was going on in society, um, about communism. And so we can relate all of the last three pieces that I'm talking about to comments about um, portrayals of the effects of war and the effects of um, different types of leadership and um, social justice causes, things like that. All three can be related to political statements. So this is a photo montage. We might look at it and say, oh, it's a collage. It is, but it's mostly a photo specifically a photo montage because they're photographs put together in a specific way. What are the colors we're looking at? We're looking at red and black and uh, white mostly and red and black right up against each other. We know as artists create a really volatile, um, striking, uh, aggressive color combination. You know, think of like ACDC um, think of anything else that's red and black together and it's usually has something to do with aggression or bright vibrant trying to grab your attention so this is propaganda um, this is to talk about the five-year plan the first five-year plan that was put into place by Stalin although the man in this picture that was put in later is Lenin um, the CCD, is, or the CC, yeah, I think, or A or whatever this is supposed to be, um, is the USSR, the, what we call the, the USSR. So let's look at the composition. Um, there are p huge power lines coming out of Lenin's side of his face while his mouth is open. Um, this alludes to the technology that... Um, was the major part of the plan, making sure that technology was elevated um, within the USSR. Uh, we've got also these loud sort of megaphone looking things that also were there for the same reason, talking about um, a loud, powerful voice and gathering of technology. Um, this, it, you've got huge crowds of people cheering, following Lenin on. Um, he is massive. He's raised over his followers and it looks like he's in the middle of a very emotional speech that's going to maybe stir up his followers and invite everybody else to follow him too. So as a piece of propaganda, this is important because, you know, think about the other pieces of propagandas that glorify leaders. Okay. Think about who dens um, George Washington, think about Apollos, think about um, David, um, you know, these stat those are all statues, but they're all sort of glorifying, or the Alexander the Great uh, mosaic, they're all there to persuade people to follow somebody, um, and to show why all of the reasons why or to really you know get get a base going and so one major way to do that is to sh say look everybody else is doing it look at this huge crowd following uh lenin now and following the five-year plan and they look happy and excited to do it and they're cheering for it 
So if everybody else is doing it, then it must be a good thing, right? That's, I mean, the case of showing all of those things. It's sort of like the toilet paper crisis we're in right now. Everybody else is buying tons and tons of toilet paper. So we we sh- should probably get on board with that and buy a bunch of toilet paper too. We don't know why that, you know, but everybody else is doing it. So it must be a good idea. I don't know. Um, so as a piece of propaganda, this works very well. Now, um, whoop, got ahead of myself. Sorry. Context. Okay. So if this is an ode to the success, hopefully you can see me doing these, of the first five-year plan started by Stalin. The plan was a list of strategic goals designed to grow the Soviet economy and accelerate its industrialization. Um, collective farming, creating a military and artillery industry, increasing steel production, and major, major um, emphasis on technology, right? So by the end of the first five-year plan in 1933, five years later, the USSR became a leading industrial power. However, um, later on, contemporary historians found that the economists from the USSR maybe lied a little bit to enhance their image. No politicians ever do that, right? Um, Unheard of. So looking back, maybe they weren't as um, successful as they originally thought. Um, In this work, Stepanova uses the tools of the propagandist. She sets up this ideal image, um, visual evidence, like look at these actual photographs of people, look how successful this is, and this is before Photoshop, so, but it is kind of Photoshopping it together, isn't it? It's sort of, um, you know, creating this false image through other images, um, like you see today in the news. You see people using um, fake images and videos that they've doctored a little bit to skew people's ideas about society or this party or that party. So not too far off. Um, it's also, oh, here she is in the studio with her um, I don't know, partner and assistant worker. And I thought I had a little bit about this, but oh, it's over here. It's important to note that the five-year plan wasn't so successful. Um, Let's see, I wanted to tell you, oh, just for some more context, she, um, this work and a a lot of her other works were featured in the USSR in Construction, which is a propagandist publication, a whole magazine dedicated to it, Um, and it, it went out to show people falsely that the USSR was the leading force in the global market and economy. we talked about that, but I wanted to tell you, where is it in my notes? Um, oh, here we go. So the plan was actually not as popular as this artwork and uh, the propaganda would have led you to believe. Some of you might already know this, my history buffs. Um, it was actually the cause of a lot of suffering and death. The plan resulted in radical measures that forced farmers to give up their land and their livestock. Many people were reduced to extreme poverty. Famine spread widely. Um, and, and so what started to be, yeah, let's do this. This is going to be great. Um, this propaganda, eventually people began to suffer from the five-year plan. And the propaganda became a way to hide the disastrous policy from the rest of the world. The, creating these images hid. It looked like everybody was there um, celebrating, but in reality, people were dying and people were revolting. But Stepanova here, our artist, maybe she's a villain, uh, still claimed no, like she did anything wrong. And she truly believed in the five-year plan. So we've got a artist villain. Not the first time, right? Cook it. Um, I, I just want to do one more in today's little podcast, whatever you want to call this. Um, and then I'll stop and I'll do another one. So you don't have to watch it all at the same time. Um, we are 
I'm going to move, yes, into this Improvisation 28 by Vasily Kandinsky. Um, he is, moves from Russia to Germany um, to take part in this expression as a movement in the uh, early 20th century. And this is his painting here. At this slide, I would say, what do you guys see? Look at it like you might look at clouds in the sky and make out some forms. What, what do you see? And then we'll talk about it. A little bit of context. Uh, Der Blue Reiter was German for the Blue Rider. That was um, Franz Marx and Vasily Kandinsky's belief that blue was the most spiritual color and that the writer symbolized the ability to move beyond. Pretty deep, right? So here is a blue writer. This is actually Kandin one of Kandinsky's paintings called The Blue Rider, and it is a person in blue riding the horse. So a few things to note that I think are important um, in understanding why he painted this. Um, Kandinsky was part of this movement of expressionists that were leaning towards expressing themselves, expressing their vision, expressing their feelings, moods, um, conceptual ideas about life and religion and the world, rather than, again, painting what they saw. That was old news. That was yesterday. Um, artists are moving into a level where they believe what the concept behind the art is more important than the technique. And the way that they painted, they were experimenting with different ways to paint. So using lots of blue to symbolize, um, you know, spirituality and um, transcendence. And he also believed in synesthesia. Do you remember the father of expressionism? Um, I'll give you a hint. Um, the Scream, that painting, remember we talked about um, the artist having synesthesia, which was where they believed um, that you could smell sounds, you could hear colors, you could taste, um, you know, certain um I was going to say colors again, but yeah, any of that, the senses are all sort of mixed up and it, it sort of makes sense to me in a way where I think of, um, when I see, um, I think it, it sort of makes sense where if you see something or you hear maybe a song and it reminds you to, um, of, of a time and place in your life where, you know, you were eating popsicles out in the sunshine. And so that song to you reminds you or tastes like popsicles. I, I know that sounds crazy, maybe. But in an artist's mind, it makes kind of sense. Um, you know, and certain colors do have those meanings for us. We look at, I look at orange, and I think it is a warm, comfortable, cozy feeling. So orange, even though it's my sight, it feels warm to the touch, I think, uh, for example. And, you know, certain shades of colors remind me of certain things. So, synesthesia. Moving on. Um, he was best, Kandinsky was best friends with the Schoenbergs. There's Kandinsky here. There's uh, the Schoenbergs here. He was a composer. He was, you know, art was getting experimental. So was music. Um, here is Schoenberg's one of Schoenberg's pieces that was very experimental and atonal. And I want you to listen to this and then think about, look at, let's look at the painting. Let me find a good, a good bar where it gets a little wacky. Oh, I think it's going to get wacky over here.
Maybe not the most beautiful song you've ever heard. Kind of sporadic, kind of all over the place. Like I said, no real rhythm or um, direction, kind of crazy. And Kandinsky used that as inspiration for this painting and many of his others. So he was known for the painter of music as well. This piece specifically, now let's take it apart here. He um, was Christian and believed in painting sort of themes from the Bible through this painting here. So it can be interpreted as, um, well, there's some people that interpret it as the Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. So we've got the water here and we've got this hill up here with the little, some homes up there. Um, and we have chaos and some people see war as uh, these blue forms as being horses and we've got a cannon maybe or weapons that we can see diagonal lines which we know in our history represent chaos um what else am i missing uh the forces of good and evil um a lot of his paintings um are rooted in this literary source, the revelation of St. John the Divine, which is a conflict of good and evil. Um, what else can I tell you? Some people believe this is a representation of the apocalypse. So we've got the four horsemen of the apocalypse, another person riding on a horse, that makes sense, we relate it back to the original, um, the blue horse rider. Um, and so you can maybe see that, maybe you can see they have, were holding weapons, so maybe you can get that from here. Um, what else? We talked about the Great Flood, Noah's Ark, the Apocalypse, but he also loved the feeling of redemption. And, um, the idea that, um, people can, um, you know, rise from the ashes and be forgiven and be redeemed. So for him, he honestly believed that, you know, this is right before World War I. Um, he's Russian, moved to Germany, but as you, as you know, a lot of political turmoil, a lot of turmoil in the world. And he thought that, um, a new civilization would emerge in the 20th century and he his art would help to form that civilization and through his art he could communicate a new um, civilization a rebirth a redemption of people who um, might look at his art and feel um, connected to it in all of those different ways so he believed his art was really and what he was doing was very important. Um, there's Kandinsky there, painting. Um, oh, it's important to note that pure abstraction is has absolutely nothing recognizable in it, where this is abstracted, but we can still see forms, like um, these buildings up on a mountain and the, the fire and the waves. So this is not purely abstract work. This is just abstracted. So important. Oh, it's also important to note, uh, that's more of his paintings, the name, Improvisation 28. What does that sound like? That sounds like uh, a song. That does not sound like like a classical song, you know, on, a, on the piano. Doesn't sound like by Beethoven. Does not sound like the name of a painting. But this, for the first time, uh, Vasily Kandinsky believes that you compose art like you compose a song and that it's very similar. So hence the name and of course the influence of his friend who was a composer. Schroeder. Um, and here's more later on that you can see um, more of the city. And then we have some complete abstraction over here on the right where he's playing with color. And the one above it where he's 
um, painting to music again using forms and colors very intuitive not necessarily having a plan um i think i'm done for this video i'm gonna give you guys a break from my voice but i miss you all and i can't wait to see you and do this in person sometime hopefully this helps if you're taking notes because you can pause it you know throughout if i'm going too fast or rewind and hear what i said but um it surely doesn't take the place of seeing your beautiful faces so can't wait to do that see your faces hopefully i do soon but join me on a zoom meeting if you would rather have this live um and check google classroom for resources okay see you guys